All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the University of Washington. This, uh, this SCI forum is brought to you by the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System, which was made possible by a grant through the support of the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Today we have a, um, a very interesting um, discussion point and talk on uh, the use of medical marijuana to manage the symptoms associated with spinal cord injury. And this is being presented by Dr. Gregory Carter. Dr. Carter has been involved in over 20 years of research and years in clinical research studying uh, how cannabis can actually ease the symptoms of neuromuscular diseases such as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. He's written two textbooks on the medicinal use of cannabis, as well as co-authored over 180 peer-reviewed journal articles, of which nearly one-third focus on the use of medical cannabis. He's co-founded the Muscular Dystrophy Association ALS Center at the University of Washington and the MDA Regional Neuromuscular Disease Center at Providence St. Peter Hospital in Olympia. He subsequently received the Excellence in Clinical Care Award from the MDA National Office. Dr. Carter is a past recipient of the Distinguished Researcher Award of the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine, the Best Research Paper published by a Physiatrist Award from the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, and the Excellence in Research Writing Award from the Association of Academic Physiatrists. So he's got all the different associations covered here. Dr. Carter is also editor of the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Clinics of North America and is senior associate editor for the medical journal Muscle and Nerve, which is our primary EMG or electrodiagnostic journal. For the past seven months, he served as a medical director of St. Luke's Rehabilitation Institute in Spokane, Washington. So please give a warm uh, welcome to Dr. Greg Carter. Thank you. So thank you for the very kind introduction Dr. Reyes, and it's uh, certainly my honor to be here to speak with you all. Um, <clears throat> I should, I guess, mention for the sake, I'm really a neuromuscular guy, not a spinal cord injury guy, but there's a lot of crossover. Um, and I do want to acknowledge uh, that my research is now at least partially sponsored by the Attorney General's Office of the State of Washington. And that was uh, funding that was recovered from uh, they call it Cypress Grants, monies that are recovered from pharmaceutical industries that were sued by the state of Washington for false advertising. <coughs> the actual PI in that grant is a lady by the name of Bia Carlini. <coughs> so there's kind of an overview of the lecture. And please interrupt me if I get a little too complicated. I'll try to keep this really straightforward and simple. I don't often get a chance to speak to, to a patient population, which is cool for me, but uh, I don't want to blind you with too much science. Um, <clears throat> so from a historical perspective, cannabis, which is really the proper term, marijuana is a Hispanic slang term. I grew up in California, not, got a lot of Hispanic friends and smoked a lot of marijuana back in the day. But when you're talking about medical applications, which is what we're here to talk about. I'm not, I have neutral feelings about recreational use, um, but we're here to talk about medical applications of cannabis. And certainly when I was smoking marijuana back in the 70s, I had no clue about any of this. So they're really two separate um, and distinct uses. And I like to keep them separate and distinct because I think the federal government likes to overlap them and sort of make a laughing stock out of pa patients that use cannabis and, oh, they're just trying to get high. Well, they, the federal government hasn't talked to some of my ALS patients who use this to keep their symptom burden down to ease their suffering. <coughs> and this is nothing new, cannabis has been used thousands of years. Carl Sagan opined that it was probably the first plant actually cultivated by humankind. It's been well documented as part of the traditional Chinese medicine and part of the Aradivic uh, East Indian medicine traditions. It was first brought into Western medicine in the 1840s by an English surgeon named William O'Shaughnessy and he learned about it from his travels through the uh, Middle East. <coughs> and actually our founding fathers, none other than George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, were, were all hemp farmers. It's an indigenous plant, or I should say was an indigenous plant to North America. It grew everywhere, used by the Native Americans for medicinal purposes and religious purposes. It was only after reefer madness that the government literally spent millions of dollars spraying toxic chemicals on the roadside trying to kill this plant. <coughs> 
Here's a quote from Thomas Jefferson for you. And believe it or not, the pharmaceutical industry at the time, because it wasn't a Schedule One drug like it is now, so marijuana is considered, and I call it marijuana because that's what the federal government calls it, is considered a dangerous drug with no medical use. And I will say on record that that, has, that statement there has no basis in reality or scientific fact. It's actually very widely documented its medical use, and I'll t tell you more about that. But before the whole reefer madness thing, it was prescribed by physicians, and you could get it at a pharmacy. And here's a bottle from 1910 of a cannabis tincture. It's a concentrated liquid made by Park Davis. And it's, uh, you can't really read because the print's too small, but it, this is nerve tonic number five. Um, not love potion number nine, but nerve tonic number five. And the reason I bring that up is because we now know on the basis of science and clinical trials that cannabis and cannabinoids work very well for neuropathic pain and spasticity, which are why I think it has applications to you all as people dealing with spinal cord injury. Here's another couple examples. And so this stuff is, was all completely eliminated in 1937 by our first drug czar, Harry Ainsinger. I don't necessarily blame him as an individual. I'm sure he was acting out of what he thought was the right thing to do. Unfortunately, he didn't grind down on opiates, which were the considerably more dangerous class of medications, but he completely eliminated all cannabis-based medicines from our pharmacosia. Oddly enough, my dad was a medic, a corpsman in the Navy in World War II, and I have a, his sailor's uniform, which was made out of 100% hemp. Hemp grows a lot faster than cotton, and the government couldn't grow enough cotton to make uniforms for the sailors and other soldiers uh, in World War II, so they had to re-legalize, kind of a, on the QT, they re-legalized hemp so they could grow it to make uniforms. <coughs> Here's another uh, preparation for neuralgic idiopathic, those are old terms, but that's from 1906. So here we are 100 years later, and everybody's excited because there's potential for cannabis to treat neuropathic pain, but this is really nothing new. What's new is the science behind it, and I'll explain that shortly. Here's another bottle. So I mentioned that already, and incidentally, that was the, the removal of cannabis from the uh, physician's armamentarium was done against the advice of the medical Ameri Amer American Medical Association. And there are a lot of other uh, really valuable uses for hemp, including clothing, food, fibers, and fuel that I'm not going to talk about today, but um, in an age where our economy is really, even though they talk about recovery, it doesn't seem like the economy that was existed when I was a kid. Um, I have four kids, and two of them have already graduated college, and one is working in Korea because he couldn't find a job in the United States, and the other one is currently unemployed. So <clears throat> there's a lot of money that could potentially be made in this, but it can't be made because of our laws. If you have any interest in the historical aspects, I think the first book is actually the best one. That's called The Emperor Wears No Clothes, written by a fellow who's passed away. I got to meet him one time named Jack Herrera. Um, the second and fourth books there are uh, ones that I've written. If you do choose to buy those on Amazon, the proceeds go to the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And the third one there is by a friend of mine, Paul Armentero, Armin, Armentano. <coughs> and those are all available on Amazon. So we do live in a changing world. And I actually um, stumbled onto this through an ALS patient who told me that she was using marijuana, as she called it then. This is back probably 20 years ago, uh, to treat her symptoms of ALS. And I actually, I mean, I didn't really pass judgment on her. I said, well, that's against the law. I can't really advocate for it. If it's helping you, I mean, we'll keep that our secret. And two years later, the law passed that allowed for the medical authorization for physicians to authorize patients to use that, and she was one of the first patients that I authorized to do so. So it's um, <clears throat> now legal for medicinal use in 20 states across the United States. The, the, the bummer here, though, is because the federal government still considers it a Schedule One drug, which means it's dangerous and has no medical use, that lumps it in with LSD and stuff like that. All of these laws in these 20 states are different. And so people always ask me, because I'm practicing in Washington, you know, hey, I'm going to go to Oregon next weekend. Is my little piece of paper good down there? Well, it isn't legally good. I think if you produce that, a, a policeman might let you go, but it's technically not. I mean, it's a separate state. You're crossing a state border with an illicit substance as viewed by the federal government. 
Um, I've been over in Spokane about six months now, and there's, you may have heard of this uh, group called the Kettle Falls Five, which I actually got called to testify in. That's a family, the uh, patriarch of the family is in his 70s. None of them have criminal records. They were growing cannabis in some acreage they had up by Colville, which is north of Spokane. And um, I guess a, well, it was spotted on a flyby by a DEA helicopter. And uh, these people are now being prosecuted by the federal government, despite um, what you hear about Obama and Eric Holder saying they're not going to prosecute medical patients. I've, it, um, I can't see why they're doing that, to be honest. <clears throat> so it's quasi-legal. I say that with a, you know, a hitch in my get-along. And now it's legal for recreational use in two states, ours here in Washington and Colorado. Now, for the record, I voted against 502, the recreational law, not on any basis. I think the war on drugs is terrible. I don't have any, you know, I think we've really blown that. But, as I said earlier, my interests are in my patients. So ha having my patients be able to get safe access to quality cannabis-based medicine. And I'm fearful that 502 is going to ruin that. I don't know that's going to happen, but, you know, then it moved over under alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. And they're talking about having people license it. And let's face it, there's a lot more money to be made in the recreational sale of cannabis, and the recreational strains are much different than the medical strains. So money drives everything. Let's, I mean, we could just skip the science here that I'm going to tell you about, but what drives everything in America is money, and there's more money to be made in recreational cannabis. I've tried for years to get clinical trials from the federal government for ALS, and they just blink at me because it's not a big issue. ALS is still an uncommon disorder. I wouldn't say it's rare. <clears throat> So one of the big game changers, I think, um, and I think most people in the field would agree, was the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. So it turns out that we make our own internal forms of cannabis, much like we make our own internal forms of opiate painkillers called endorphins. And endorphins were thought to be responsible for the runner's high for many, many years, but they could never be, the runner's high could never be blocked by Narcan, so that didn't make sense. Narcan is a drug that blocks opiate receptor binding. Turns out the runner's high is our endocannabinoid system. So what is the endocannabinoid system? Well, it's, it's an internal system where uh, versions of cannabinoids, just like that are found on the plant, are produced in our body and they are released um, from cells and they, they have specific effects and they bind to very specific receptors. There's CB1 receptors in the brain and upper parts of the spinal cord, the upper motor neuron parts of the spinal cord, and CB2 receptors in the peripheral nervous system, the gut, the immune system, and in parts of the musculoskeletal and cardiac systems. So these are neuromodulators and immunomodulators. And by that I mean they control things like muscle strength, speed of contraction, of degree of, of inflammation in the muscles and joints. Um, but they also do some interesting things in the nervous system. They seem to have a neuroprotective effect and an antioxidative effect. They activate macrophages, which are cells that go through the body and sort of clean up the debris. Um, I think cannabinoid-based medicine will, uh, maybe in our lifetimes here, have it be, be made and available for people with like rheumatoid arthritis because they're powerful anti-inflammatories and they also immune, uh, modulate the immune system. So if you have an autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, it's almost an ideal medication. Turns out it's almost an ideal medication for ALS. We're not here to talk about that, but um, <clears throat> that's what got my interest in it from that perspective. Now, the interesting thing about endocannabinoids are that they are not that chemically dissimilar from other compounds in the body, um, specifically estrogens. Uh, both estrogen and estrogens, I should say, as a group, and cannabinoids and flavonoids, which are found in dark chocolate, are a terpenoid, 21 carbon-based terpenoid compounds. And if you really want to think about this from a phylogenetic or even teleological perspective, the cannabis plant is one of the few plants in the plant world that has a true male and female species. And the cannabinoids are really only found in the male, I'm sorry, in the female plant and, and predominantly on the flowers of the female plant. They're very chemically similar to estrogens. So for those of you that believe in God, like I do, that tells me that our maker put this plant on the planet for us to use, or there wouldn't be these similarities, right? So when someone uses cannabis, 
the cannabinoids go into the body and they bind to these specific receptors and they produce specific effects. And we know those now. And the reason I want to drive that home is because a lot of prescription drugs, uh, I'm sure many of you are taking benzodiazepines made for muscle spasms, those are very dirty drugs. We know a lot of the mechanisms of action, but they're not necessarily one singular action and they're not receptor based necessarily. So maybe fast sodium channel blockade or glutamate inhibition or some things like that. But a lot of prescription drugs we don't know as much about. I mean, the pharmaceutical industry can say, well, we know it does this, 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 like uh, serotonin reuptake inhibition. Sure, those drugs do uh, inhibit serotonin reuptake in inhibition, but they haven't shown that that's actually how they treat depression. So, I mean, you just. Here we have a plant-based medicine that we can actually know binds to these specific receptors and does these things. And that's a picture or schematic of the receptor. I don't expect you to go home and memorize this. It'll be on the exam next week. <coughs> um, this looks like any other receptor in the body. The doctors out there know this. It's just a transmembrane helical structure. Nothing, there's nothing particularly unique or fancy. The uh, mu receptors, the opiate receptors are very similar in structure, the G protein coupled receptors. So there's nothing unique here. Um, kind of more of the same. This is unique. So I'm guessing a lot of you out there have trouble with spasticity. Maybe even your legs jump sometimes. Um, people with ALS have similar problems. And that is caused by disinhibition. So if you, if you had a spinal cord injury, and let's say a complete, just for the sake of argument, C6 quadriplegic, well, there's a separation between the higher centers in the brain, the motor cortex specifically, and your lower motor neurons. Because there's, let's just say it was a complete injury. <clears throat> well, that's what causes the spasticity in mam mammalian animals, um, and actually in avian species too, uh, so like I said that because of chickens. So you wring a chicken's neck, actually you kill it, because I did research on chickens, they're god-awful animals. But you see, if you wring your neck to, to kill them so you can get their muscles out of them, um, they would flap and, and they'd try to move around the lab, even though the thing was dead, theoretically. And that's because by doing that, I removed the tonic inhibition of the brain. And so when you think about, um, I've heard of pilots, I think that guy that landed the thing in the Hudson did this, but you know, if, you're, if your hydraulics go out, or no, that was a guy years ago, I remember this guy saved a bunch of lives, a pilot by, he lost his hydraulics, he couldn't use the ailerons, so he, he used his engines, he like braked his engines to steer the thing. And that's the way our bodies work. So um, if, you, if you have a spinal cord injury, you know, your, your limbs may jump like that, or somebody taps you, or if it's somebody loud like that, boom, your, your, your legs jump like that. That's because you don't have the normal tonic inhibition. Well, that's probably partially controlled by the endocannabinoid system. And the unique thing about the endocannabinoid system is it works by retrograde transmission. So normally, um, if you had a thought in your motor cortex saying, you know, move my pinky, you would send a signal down the nerves, and if, if you didn't have any injury or interruption, it would go down into the lower motor neuron, subsequently into the muscle, and the boom, it would move. That's called classic or uh, anterograde neurotransmission. The endocannabinoid system seems to work backwards. So it's like the chemicals are swimming upstream. And that's actually been pretty well documented. So that's why people think it's probably part of the tonic inhibition in our system. So uh, let's talk about, the, hey, let's say you want to use it. What's it going to do to your body? Well, again, the cannabinoids of which there are about a hundred, and we'll talk about those a little more later, aren't that different from a lot of other compounds. They get bound up by proteins, um, which is typical of most drugs. They get metabolized as they go through your liver. Um, they don't get completely deactivated. A lot of drugs are completely in inactivated by the liver. Um, that's not true with cannabis. After they pass through the liver, they come out with still some activity. Their elimination from the body is very slow. Um, and you've probably all heard the urban legend that you can flunk a drug test 30 days after you smoke a joint. That's true. Actually, it is true because the cannabinoids are oil-based compounds. They dissolve in oil. <coughs> so I'll tell you a quick story. Back when I was in college um, in the 70s, we had this huge bong 
And um, occasionally, if we really wanted to kick it up a notch, we'd put Jack Daniels in the bong instead of water. And so what we were doing is actually leaching out all of the active ingredients and just inhaling a bunch of smoke, but we thought we were cool. Shows you why you should pay attention in chemistry class. So um, these uh, people that make tea as well, you can't dissolve cannabis in water. Now you can, now the East Indian culture and part of Aridavic medicine, they make something called bong, it's B-H-A-N-G, which is a milk-based tea and they boil the cannabis in milk and the oils in the milk, the milk fats, will leach the, the cannabinoids into the milk and that's how they prepare their tea. Um, oh, I did want to mention, um, I'll talk more about the safety. In, in terms of pregnant women, it is a category C drug, meaning we really don't have enough information. Um, so how does it help in spinal cord injury? Well, um, <clears throat> again, I'm not a spinal cord injury expert, but I am an expert in ALS, and there's a lot of overlap. So uh, I know people with spinal cord injury have problems with pain. I think you call it differentiation pain or something. They used to call it that. I don't know. But um, ALS people have the same thing. And a lot of times the pain is associated with profound muscle spasticity. So the cannabinoids are analgesics. They work very well for nerve type pain, and I'll come back to that. Um, but they also have an uh, anti-spasticity effect. And the anti-spasticity effect is actually felt to be mediated through GABA, so it may work similar to baclofen. Baclofen's a good drug, actually. I prescribe a lot of baclofen. But cannabinoids can enhance the effect of baclofen or even neurotin, which is another drug that works through that GABA pathway. Um, the cannabinoids improve sleep. They improve appetite. Um, and they decrease your need for opiates. So one of the things that really, really got me interested in this is um, in taking care of ALS patients and even, even men with Duchenne dystrophy, so I would always get referred to after the boys survived, if they were able to make it into their 20s, that I'd get, get these, these young men who were profoundly weak, and, but a lot of times they had pain, they had con joint contractures, but if you give them any amount of, of opiate, they're going to stop their breathing. So one of the dangerous things about opiate-based medicines, and I'm talking about Oxycontin, morphine, oxycodone, um, what have you, fentanyl is, uh, and methadone, those, those suppress your breathing. And I think um, certainly in people with high spinal cord injury, that could be a downright dangerous. Um, and interestingly enough, too, the emerging literature would show that you don't really, even though you can get used to opiates, you can still overdose by respiratory suppression. So you don't really get the tolerance to the respiratory suppression effects. No possibility of that happening with cannabis-based medicines. There's no LD50. That's the lethal dose 50. There's no described overdose dosage for any cannabis-based medicine. That's a huge thing right there. The other huge advantage is it doesn't cause constipation. I know that's a big deal in spinal cord injury. It's a big deal in ALS patients. It's a big deal in muscular dystrophy patients because they're not moving much. So just the immobility alone causes constipation. Well, if you have pain, you take opiates, you know, you're going to end up with a mega colon. You're just, your bowels are going to back up and it just turns into a nightmare. Actually, the cannabinoids have a weakly stimulatory effect on, on the gut. So those are some huge advantages. Um, now, this is a big deal. So I told you I, would, I wouldn't hit you with too much science, but I'm going to give you a little bit of science here. Um, I think most people, you know, everybody talks about THC and blah, 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 and that's, that's what cannabis is and they talk about by the way I just want to say synthetic marijuana there's stuff called spice that has nothing to do with any of this that's a chemicals that they spray on plant products it's dangerous it is dangerous but that's I hate that they call it synthetic marijuana it's not synthetic marijuana synthetic marijuana is dronabinol or marinol uh, which uh, any of the docs in the room can prescribe as a schedule 3 drug so now wrap your head around this marinol dronabinol is 100 percent THC and that is the single psychoactive ingredient in natural cannabis. And the federal government regulates that as a Schedule 3, which means we could phone it in and, and with additional refills. Natural cannabis, at best, recreational strains have up to 20% THC, because that is what recreational users like. That somehow converts over to a dangerous drug with no medical use. Now, I spent four months of my life writing a petition that Governor Gregoire signed uh, along with an addictionologist, I got an addictionologist friend from back at the State University of New York, Mitch Erlewine. Him and I wrote this 700-page appeal to the DEA to reschedule cannabis 
not to Schedule 3 or 4 where it should be, but just up to Schedule 2. Schedule 2 would put it in with good actors like uh, fencyclidine, which is related to ketamine on the street that's called Angel's Dust. That's a Schedule 2 drug. So the government considers that safer than pot. Uh, methamphetamine and amphetamines. Well, heck, we can give our kids Ritalin. You know, Ritalin is basically just a, a methyl group different from methamphetamine, which is the dangerous actor, right? But we can give our kids with ADHD. So I'm here to say on record, and I'll debate anybody from the federal government, that the scheduling, it doesn't make any sense scientifically. And that's all I've ever asked for or appealed for, is that let's use the science to make decisions here. So here are some of the other important active ingredients in natural cannabis. Now, I said THC is the single intoxicant. It is. And I think it's too intoxicating. And my patients don't, most of them I'm sure, don't necessarily want to be intoxicated. That's not why I'm authorizing their use. It's for pain relief, relief of muscle spasms. And I honestly think um, that people that have not used recreational pot or are not looking for that don't even find the intoxication all that pleasant time disorientation, maybe goofiness or something. Certainly an ALS patient that's trying to spend quality time with their family doesn't want to be high. They want to be present. So medical strains will have higher amounts of these other cannabinoid compounds. And CBD is one you may have heard of. That's cannabinol, I'm sorry, cannabidiol. And CBD is a powerful analgesic medication. And importantly, it moderates the effects of THC. Um, the, the second one is cannabinol, which is an anticonvulsant, and anticonvulsant drugs generally work very well for neuropathic pain, and I think that's an important actor in treating neuropathic pain. There are probably 80 to 100 cannabinoids, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on here, but what I want you to realize is that natural cannabis is a lot more than THC, and I don't really even prescribe Marinol or Dronabinol. It's about $10 a pill, and most patients find it uh, just to be too powerful, just knocks them on their lips, puts them puts them out. Um, there are some scientists that have developed a new strain of cannabis um, in Israel that has no THC. I don't know. I, I, you know, I think, again, um, I have my own personal beliefs, but I think uh, whoever put us on this rock and created this, this place for us to live uh, has more sense and insight than we do, and these natural plant things were designed for our use. And Yes, we have brilliant scientists, but when you think about cocoa leaves, which helped the native South Americans work in the fields and then turn that into cocaine, you think about opium poppies, you turn that into heroin, on and on. Um, you know, those, those, those ideas of concentration and purification don't always work out so well. So here are some uh, references. I like to put these references in there to make me look smart. <coughs> no, just kidding. To uh, provide you some uh, comfort that I am not speaking off my top of my head. Everything that I say to you here today, I can provide scientific references for you. And that's the way I've tried to operate in this field um, from the beginning. I think it's important. So there's a lot of um, stuff that will probably bore you here, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But there is research out there, and there is strong evidence that cannabinoids have therapeutic beneficial effect. Now. I mentioned earlier that I've tried to get some research money to do uh, trials on ALS and maybe even spinal cord injury. Um, if you do research in the United States, you have to go through the National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, and if you're lucky enough to get funding, I've been turned down twice. Um, some people have been successful, though. Donald Abrams is a colleague of mine in San Francisco who has been funded. Um, you have to have your patients use the medicine that's grown by the federal government down in Mississippi and it's delivered as cigarettes, joints, which yes, you can dose actually pretty well, but I'm not an advocate of anybody smoking anything. I certainly don't want my ALS patients and I wouldn't think anybody want their spinal cord injury patients smoking because you may already have weakness in your breathing muscles. <clears throat> so, and if you were lucky to get funded, you get about a half million dollars. Now I've done regular pharmaceutical based trials and those are in the billions of dollars. So the weight of evidence and the quality of the studies done with natural cannabis is not going to hold up to a industry-based pharmaceutical trial. However, this is just something to keep you awake at night. You know, we're turning a lot, in the United States, we're turning a lot of our drug research over to private industry. 
you know, maybe in the sake of God-given capitalism, but I'm kind of old school that way, and I've played ball with pharmaceutical companies. You have to these days because they have all the money, but they don't have to release the data that they don't want to. Um, and I, we've been burned on that before. Drugs come out, and like a few years later, it's like, whoops, we're sorry, it killed a few people. Uh, here, we'll, give, we'll throw some money at it. So the problem when you have industry-based research is you have bias built into the system. And there's enough bias in sciences already. So this was, uh, I mentioned Donald Abrams. He's an oncologist down at UC San Francisco. He studies uh, HIV-related painful neuropathy. And you don't really have to be a doctor or scientist to see this slide. So the, the bottom, so the, the higher up on the graph, the more pain. And so the people that got placebo had the higher levels of pain. And the lower line there is people that got cannabis, 3% THC rolled in cigarettes delivered by the U.S. federal government. The impressive thing there, though, if you look, and um, the last cigarette was smoked on day six, and they still had pain relief for about a week after that. And remember I said the cannabinoids are stored up in the body, they're stored in your fat cells, and to a certain extent in your nervous system. So those compounds leach out slowly. Yes, that's among the reasons you can flunk a drug test 30 days later. But it, for me as a doctor, that's a good thing. So if, if somebody's taking oxycodone, that drug has a three to four hour half-life. It's gone from your body. You take 10 milligrams Percocet, you know, you might feel good for three to four hours, and then boom, it drops off. Now you can make Oxycontin, which is just time-release oxycodone, and that lasts a little longer. But still, that's an, a, a water-soluble compound that you're going to urinate out or excrete in your feces, and it's going to be gone. And that's why people have cravings for these drugs. There is no real physical addiction to cannabis. There's a psychological addiction, and that can be harsh. People that, particularly using it for escape from reality or for the inducement of um, euphoria and such, that, I, I, they're not denying that. You can become psychologically addicted to cannabis. But there's no harsh withdrawal like there is with opiates, or even nicotine for that matter. And it's this slowness of leaving the body that does that. Drugs that have a zero to 60 effect go into your body real fast and the effect draws off real fast, those are the ones that get into trouble. I mean, heroin was actually originally developed as a powerful pain medication, and God knows it is, but that's a zero to 60 and then drop off real fast. So if somebody shoots heroin, the IV particularly gets into the body real fast. Smoking is the other thing. Why do people smoke anything, including tobacco? Because it gets the drug into the body real fast. And that, frankly, that's why people smoke pot. Um, We'll talk about that more in a minute. So here are some of the, I'm just going to scoot through this and you can read this at your leisure, but I like to have these in my talks. And I left them in here, usually I'm talking to physicians, I left them in here just so you know that I'm not blowing smoke here, no pun intended. Um, in fact, I pride myself in trying to base everything I say to you today in some scientifically grounded uh, basis. Um, so a class one clinical trial means that there was a placebo group and there was a, a treatment group and nobody knew who was getting what. And yes, you can have placebo cannabis pot and such. Um, I remember in high school they actually burned some of it and passed it around the classroom. Everybody was trying to inhale it, but it's just placebo. You can, it's okay to laugh. Um, so this, is, this, is, this was a, what they call a Cochrane review. It was a systematic review of 18 trials done on cannabis. And 15 of the 18 showed a significant analgesic effect. And this was um, all over the map in terms of diagnoses. Um, I can't recall if there was spinal cord injury, but was fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic pain. Uh, you have to go back and look. There are, I'm guessing there were some spinal cord people in there. The uh, overall rating was excellent. Um, and 15 out of 18 trials showed a significant analgesic effect and there were no serious adverse effects. That's huge right there because I've done pharmacy-based trials and even the people that are getting placebo <laughs> report adverse effects. Um, so I the overall weight of evidence in, is markedly in favor of cannabinoids being safe and effective to treat pain. So how would this work in real life? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you have to you know, I think I guess things have changed from 502, but I I really prefer if you're if you're a patient if you have a spinal cord injury you should go to your doctor. You never want to withhold anything from your doctor. And I've fired patients even though I'm in favor of medical cannabis. If, if somebody turns up on a 
urine test positive, and they haven't told me about it, I fire them because I demand complete um, openness. And it's almost like a relationship between your priest or what have you, your rabbi. You know, you got to tell me everything, and I got to know what you're putting in your body because I'm prescribing other stuff. So if you are already using cannabis and your doctor doesn't know about it, tell him or her. Do not hide that. There are some drug-drug interactions, and your doctor needs to know everything you're putting in your body, <clears throat> including vitamins and other things like that. So let's say you decide you want to give this a try. Well, you'd have to talk to your physician about it. Your physician has to sign what's called an authorization, and that is not a prescription. Physicians cannot prescribe cannabis because it's still considered a dangerous drug by the federal government. It's not allowed. Schedule one drug, I can't prescribe LSD, I can't prescribe cannabis. Um, but we are protected by freedom of speech, and since the state of Washington allows for medical use, your physician could write that, you know, John Doe uh, is a C6 quadriplegic, and I feel that he or she would be benefited by the use of medical cannabis. And there's a DOH form on the website, WSMA website also has it. It has to be written on tamper-proof paper, just like a prescription. And you take that piece of paper to a co-op. Some people call it a green card. It's not a card. It's a full sheet of paper. Oregon has cards. We don't have cards. <clears throat> and um, when I just recently in Spokane, I authorized a patient, and the co-op called me and said, well, as soon as you dated it, you invalidated it. And I just said, dude, I'm a doctor. Anytime I write my name down, I'm going to put a date and a time. So that guy had zero clue. There, there, the expiration date, what the law says is you have to be followed by the physician who is recommending the use of cannabis, which is also, I guess, why I'm against the little doc in the box clinics, too, because you don't have any doctor or patient relationship, which I think is important. I think this stuff is medicine, and because I think it's medicine, I think you need a doctor physician relationship and supervision. So um, you, get the, you go to a co op and you obtain cannabis. I've been doing this a long time, so I got to know all the co-ops, and I would tell the co-ops that I want my patients to have low THC cannabis, cannabis that is high in CBD and CBN. Um, so patient gets some cannabis. The physician will have to tell them how to dose it. So the way you dose this stuff is to start low and go slow. By that, I mean you start with a small amount, and you titrate it up slowly. Now, the best way to get a fast effect is to use a vaporizer. Vaporizers have kind of been hijacked by the tobacco industry now in these e-cigarettes. So what a vaporizer does is it heats up the plant material to around 2 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit, and stuff goes into a, into a hot aroma or mist. And then you inhale that hot mist, and you get a pretty rapid effect, just like you would if you were smoking it, but there's no smoke involved. The advantage there is because of the rapid effect, you can take three or four inhalations and stop and see how you feel. And you can usually get pain relief and relief from spasticity before you get intoxicated, well before. There's a picture of a couple of vaporizers. Probably some of you are familiar with the Volcano. That's kind of the granddaddy. Those are 500 bucks. That's pretty pricey. Most of my patients could not afford that. This little box vaporizer here is made by the vapor store. It's 100 bucks, and they're pretty reliable. And it has a thermistor on there, so you can see you guys got it heated to 214 degrees. If you turn it up too high, you'll start burning the thing in combustion, then you're inhaling smoke. Um, so you really want to hit that sweet spot around maybe 200, 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Incidentally, this is not much different than aromatherapy, and it is the same thing, as the same idea as an e-cigarette. Um, so I already covered that. Start with a small amount, two to three inhalations, stop, wait 10 minutes. Do not need to be high to get pain relief. Now you can ingest it. Um, so if you have a full stomach and you ate a, a cannabis-laced brownie, it may take a couple hours to get the effect. And I've kind of learned the hard way that patients will sometimes, um, in excitement to get pain relief, ingest too much, and they'll be unpleasantly intoxicated. I mean, I've had people come back to me and say, that stuff really made me feel funny, and I'll bet it did. Um, so that's the bugger with ingestion. Now, you can get concentrated liquids or tinctures and can be dissolved in glycerol. And a lot of the co-ops in Seattle, I haven't found this so much in Spokane yet, but a lot of the co-ops around here now are using this lab called Analytical 360. Um, actually, one of the University of Washington faculty members' son is one of their chemists. Um, so that, this is a legitimate lab, um, and they use uh, gas chromatography to analyze cannabis samples. So a good co-op now can make tinctures that 
say like 10% THC, 10% cannabidiol, 5% cannabinol. So, and this is not very hard at all. And actually, in that proposal that Governor Gregoire signed that we sent to the DEA, we had it all outlined this could be done state grown cannabis compounding pharmacists. It could all be above the board. It could all be very easily done. And then we can just send our patients down to the pharmacy instead of a co op. I'm not against co ops, but you sort of get into that gray area. And I certainly don't want my patients getting stuff that I don't know what's in it. But so again, if you orally ingest it, it can take a lot longer to work. It lasts longer, but it's a little harder to dose. So I still think the vaporizer, at least for starting out. Um, incidentally, uh, for those of you who have local pain, uh, maybe if you have pain in your wrists and stuff, from, from manual wheelchair pushers, it, it works very well for arthritis. And that doesn't cause any intoxication at all. Um, so cannabis is not for everybody. It has side effects. I always tell my patients about the side effects. I don't try to sell it as a miracle compound. Maybe nearly miracle, but not miracle. Um, so it does cause disinhibition, relaxation, drowsiness, feeling of well-being, exhilaration, and euphoria. Um, there are clearly slowing of time perception. It can impair your memory. Um, it can impair your balance and stability. So those of you that may still be able to walk, you gotta be careful, because it can. And I, I make a big, huge deal out of driving I've had attorneys try to tell me that it's okay to drive. No, it's not okay to drive. I actually have a thing on Epic now, there's just a little smart phrase that Docs know what I'm talking about. It just pops up and says the patient was notified that any and all substances that I have prescribed or recommended that can impair uh, driving skills are contraindicated. The patient is advised that he or she alone is responsible for acknowledging that they are capable of operating a motor vehicle. So I don't want, you know, I don't want, I, I don't want to have that guilt, you know, if a patient of mine was intoxicated or just a little bit off and they ran over somebody, I don't want that guilt on my conscience. So I make a big deal out of that. I don't think it's a good idea to drive if you're taking anything. And benzo, actually benzodiazepines, so if you look at culpability ratio where one is, is like you're just normal driving. So cannabis puts it up to like 1.5. Benzodiazepines are really bad actors. That bumps it up to four. So if you're taking Ativan or whatever fan, that jacks you up four times the risk of an automobile accident. And that's not necessarily chronic users, I think this is acute, I, I, I can't remember the methodology, but it's basically the same as alcohol. Benzodiazepines impair your driving ability as much as alcohol. Um, opiates are kind of in between, I think opiates are around two and a half, three. So cannabis does impair your ability to drive, just not as much as these other drugs. And the real bad actor, incidentally, is uh, amphetamines. That, that the culpability ratio goes up to five. So if you're jacked up on speed, you're five times as likely to get into a car wreck. Bottom line is, though, you shouldn't be driving if you're impaired by anything. So what you need to know is, <clears throat> again, to reemphasize this, I think, you know, I would certainly use this. If I had a problem, like a spinal cord injury, ALS or anything like that, I mean, uh, neuropathic pain, I'm a physician. I would, I would inquire of my own physician, you know, if, if they were, especially if he or she was trying to shove oxycodone down my throat. I said, whoa, hold on here. Let's, let's look at this. I do think and truly believe in drugs like gabapentin, uh, Neurontin, um, Lyrica, um, Cymbalta, Effexor. I mean, I prescribe those drugs, and I'm totally on board with Western medicine. Um, this should be part of Western medicine. That's my argument, is we have this God-given plant here that really has some powerful therapeutic effects that is basically removed from our armamentarium. And for those of us that treat chronic pain from whatever cause, we're always looking for better ways to treat chronic pain. Now, the differences, another some important differences, I mentioned the anti-inflammatory effects of cannabinoids. Um, they also have remarkably some neuroprotective effects I don't know how this applies to spinal cord injury. It remains to be studied. But if you took a group of Wistar rats and poisoned them with glutamate, so glutamate is a monosodium glutamate, Chinese food restaurant headache syndrome. It's an excitatory neurotransmitter. You can actually cause brain bleeding. It's kind of fallen out of the way. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and that was a big deal. The 70s, people would go into a Chinese restaurant and apparently get a headache, and it was from monosodium glutamate. Um, so if you poison rats with glutamate, and it, it will actually induce a stroke-like phenomenon in their brain. The, if you pre-dose some of those Wistar rats with a, a concoction of cannabinoids, their recovery is significantly better. So they have less residual neurological damage and better functional outcome. 
Um, that's probably by slowing the brain down a little bit, almost like a, a, a coma that they do sometimes in head area people that put them into a coma, so they slow the brain metabolism down. Remains to be seen. There's some very exciting stuff there, though, in the world of neuroprotection and some emerging stuff in neuroregeneration. Does that mean you take this and your nerves are going to heal? No, I don't know what it means. I'm just throwing that out there. And there's also some interesting stuff in cancers, too. So, I mean, I'm contrasting that to say opiates, though, where we know all you get is, is pain relief. Now, I do want to say this, too. People that are on high dose of opiates, um, of which, you know, I've had chronic pain patients for years, and I've put patients on huge doses of opiates. Um, now I'm trying to get people on lower doses of opiates, and I've used cannabis to do that. The one thing you all need to know as patients is you may convince your doctor to let you try this, and you're going to go home and use it. If you're taking like Oxycontin, 80 milligrams twice a day, and you take three to four inhalations of cannabis, you're not going to feel anything. Three to four inhalations of cannabis, just ballparking is like five milligrams of oxycodone. So it's, this is not a super powerful set of compounds. Um, and again, it gets back to, you know, um, it, it's, it's more like kind of pushing things forward a little bit. Western medicine is famous for sledgehammers. You know, if you have a headache, you're going to go in and get Imitrex and what have you. These powerful medications. If you're using natural medicine, medicine plant-based medicines, you should not expect a sledgehammer effect. But the payoff is it's safer. Uh, so I think people that use medicinal cannabis can use it for years and years and years and maybe get some actual health benefits. Now, understand that I'm separate and distinct here from people that are heavy, daily recreational smokers and they drive around looking stoned and stupid. That happens. I mean, people can abuse this drug and, you know, become burnouts, whatever you want to call them. That's a totally separate discussion. Appropriate medical use would be reasonable amounts used in timely fashion, maybe two to three times a day, under the uh, supervision of a physician. And that's the way medicine is practiced. Covered that. Um, it is not for everyone. Um, I would say about 5% of people that have come to me seeking this, um, you know, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work for whatever reason. And I don't push it. I'll do two or three tries, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Or they don't like the effects, or they can't, it just doesn't produce a beneficial effect for them. I screen all my patients, too, for addiction and such, just like I do with opiates. Now, there is a new drug called Sativex or Sativex, which is made in uh, the United Kingdom. And that is uh, a strain of plants that GW Pharmaceuticals cloned that produces 50-50 ratio of THC and CBD. And there's also some natural terpenoids in there. I just found that out because I went to a lecture by the company. Uh, this is a good product, actually. So I'm not opposed to stuff like this. I mean, this is a good product. It's not approved for use in the United States. And when it does get approved, it's going to be super expensive. Um, that's, that's the problem with our system now, is once stuff gets into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry, it's going to be super expensive. Um, and maybe I'm getting old-fashioned in my old age, but if you, there's a group in Seattle called Grandmas for Ganja. If you can grow tomato plants, you can grow cannabis plants. It's indigenous to this country. So, man, if you could grow your own medicine, I don't know. I've practiced medicine for 20 years. That's starting to sound pretty cool. Rather than being enslaved to this $400 a month prescription, you're always worried about your copay going up. You know, I don't know. We just need a total paradigm shift. We're the only first world country that does not regulate its pharmaceutical industry. And, you know, you can't blame those guys if they're, they're going to charge with a market will bear. So I'll close out by saying if you and your doctor decide to try this, follow the law. That's kind of a no-brainer. Um, obtain high-quality medicinal cannabis that is low in THC, high in CBD, high in CBN. You do not need to be high to get pain relief. And use a delivery route that maximizes benefits and minimizes side effects. I think vaporization, oral ingestion with a tincture, or if you have localized pain, rubbing it on in a liniment. I do not advocate for smoking anything. <clears throat> um, the human lungs are not meant to... Uh, process smoke. So this is, uh, I was, uh, grew up, you know, watching Star Trek, and uh, this is a quote from Commander Spock, first science officer, change is the essential process of all existence. And of course, my hero, Dr. McCoy, 
And then for the doctors out there, it's pretty easy, actually. Smell two joints and call me in the morning. So I'll entertain questions. So she asks, is the liniment available? So you all are blessed here in Seattle. I used to practice down in Olympia and Centralia, but my patients would have access all over. I mean, the west side is, is, is the cat's out of the bag. I mean, you have co-ops that are using gas chromatography. I mean, you're, you're, you can get bottles that tell you exactly what's in there. And yes, they make liniments. Um, you can also make, uh, you know, if you take, well, I shouldn't say it because you're going to blow something up, but camphor, which is like noxema, if you put that in a crock pot and you put your natural cannabis in there and let it stew overnight, the camphor um, will pull, just like, you know, it's like butter. It pulls the cannabinoids out and then you sift off the plant material and then you're left with noxema that's inf infused with cannabis. And it goes through the skin very well. Does it lower blood pressure? That's a great question. No. Um, but it can cause um, cardiac arrhythmias in people that are sensitive to that. Um, and I didn't really get into drug-drug interactions because it's a lay audience. Um, it decreases the bioavailability of, uh, is that me? It decreases the bioavailability of methadone. So if you're on methadone and you use cannabis, you're not going to get as big of an effect in the methadone. Um, it has a weak, uh, what we call anticholinergic effect, so it can speed up your heart rate. THC is predominantly the one that does that, actually. Um, but no, it doesn't actually have a, a blood pressure lowering effect, but it can cause people to get lightheaded, and that's a little different. So you could pass out, but it's not like, a, like an orthostatic event. It's just from intoxication. And that's why, you know, for those of you that may still walk partially or something, you have to be very careful. Um, and you have to use common sense. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, if you start low, go slow. If you try it for the first time, do it in the, you know, comfort of your home, maybe when you're watching TV or something, and just, you know, see how it affects you. This gentleman has, has a, is, if you don't mind me sharing. So he has a, a history of addiction. And, you know, 10% of us all have addiction problems. I mean, in human beings, that's part of the affliction of humanity. So um, if you came to me, you know, we would get that out on the table. Um, there's a couple ways to look at that. I mean, if you really have hardcore addiction problems, you should probably stay away from any mind-altering substance. Um, if you're having pain, I guess it comes down to a, you know, how much suffering can you tolerate. I think from a harm perspective viewpoint, and, and I've had plenty of addictionologists, you know, second this opinion. Okay, well, if you had, let's say you had back pain or something, you, and the physician was saying, well, we could go with oxycodone or some kind of opiate, I would say cannabis would be a much better choice. If there was something like gabapentin that worked for you, I'd probably go that route first. I mean, can't... I take that route. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, addiction is an issue, and you'd have to be very careful. I mean, the addiction with cannabis is psychological. It's not physical. So if you had to stop it or what have you, you wouldn't writhe on the floor and vomit, but you might feel depressed and irritable. Thank you very much.